here I do have a, about, I don't know, 10 or so slides that cover the common mistakes or issues or points of interest when you're rebuilding this transmission. It's very common for students to put the accumulators in backwards. There's only one accumulator that goes in like this, and that's the low reverse. The two that are sitting next to each other here in the case, that's the underdrive overdrive, those need to go in the accumulator piston in first, and then the spring. And the reason why people commonly install those in backwards is because the service manual shows a line art drawing and it shows a, what looks like a piston installed like this. Um, and then, but it's just very misleading. The guy has actually got uh, the, the, the accumulator assembly in his hand. And then there, uh, basically it makes it look like it was in, uh, you, you're, you're installing it in backwards or upside down. So just realize the only one that goes in spring first is the low reverse. Everything else goes in piston first, then spring. If you have an issue with high CVIs, maybe some uh, clutch engagement or slipping concerns, pay close attention to the condition of the accumulator bores. I like this one here, the picture probably doesn't do it much justice, but you can actually feel that if you ran your finger over it, it would feel like little uh, um, ridges and bumps, like rumble strips, if you will. And um, that's gonna be a, a potential for a leak. The little Teflon seals that they put around the accumulator pistons might not be able to seal up against that surface very well. And if you leak fluid out through there, that's fluid that's supposed to be going to apply the clutch. And it's also fluid that's on the opposite side of the orifices. So any leak, as I mentioned before, on the other side, on the clutch side of an orifice, is gonna cause uh, some serious problems because now the um, the clutch is competing with the leak to get fluid in there. It's already being squeezed through an orifice and some of that's being leaked out. So uh, that we're trying to minimize or eliminate leaks on the opposite sides of the, or on the clutch side of any orifice. This is something, unless you rebuild one of these in class, it's not that something you'd ever notice, but the service manual is very uh, misleading this snap ring that's in here, uh, they tell you to, to build the clutch pack underneath there. They want you to build a, a steel, friction, steel, friction, steel, friction, steel, and then they want you to put the snap ring in, and then they want you to put the last friction in, and then you put the plate on on top of it, and then put a snap ring on top of the plate. But when you read it, it you you pretty much think you're needing to build it up with a steel friction, steel friction, steel friction, snap ring plate. And you're wondering where did this extra um, clutch disc go or come from? And literally they're just having you leave the clutch disc out while you install the snap ring so you don't scuff up the snap ring or the, the, the friction disc with the snap ring during installation. So, I mean, I have students ask me about that all the time. So obviously it's a confusion that's in the service manual. Uh, so I figured it's worth mentioning here. They do have a Julian date on these transmissions. Uh, it's a 10,000 day calendar. And um, that, you know, that'll take you pretty far. Um, it'll take you roughly 30 years, a little more, you know, 365 days, maybe not that far, but um, so like this transmission here was built on the 110th day of production from the beginning of production. So this is a pretty old transmission that I took a picture of here. If they started in 1988 and a half, this transmission was probably built in 1989. So you can look at these codes to figure out how new of a transmission you have. The newer the transmission, likely the better because as they go through and discover issues and failures and faults with these transmissions and they update parts, you'd rather have something that is as late model as possible as long as it's all compatible. They do have issues with the overdrive hub. This part right here has a tendency of snapping off and uh, it's a sharp edge. You can see the machining on this thing's not very high quality. I shouldn't say sharp edge, but it's not radiused very well. If you want to, like I'm gonna draw it on the side here, 
if you want a, something to crack, design it like this. Because you create a strong stress riser right there and it'll just snap right there. If you want something to last, build that inside edge with a radius. Because there's no, it's, you know, it's, does a good job of distributing the load across that radius and doesn't focus it on one point. So that's going to give it the benefit of the doubt. It's always that inside corner too. That outside corner being sharp doesn't seem to make a difference. This part doesn't really seem to matter, but this part is where you want that radius. And I don't know why that they maybe don't have room for the radius because of some bushings and bearings that fit there, but really they need to figure out a way to do it. Uh, they don't break as much anymore because they have updated this hub and it's a lot better. Another thing that, that you can do is you can buy these bushings that go on the inside uh, that do a better job of supporting the shaft. A lot of people said that these shafts had a tendency of breaking because they, um, the bushings were worn out or sloppy in these transmissions and after they get some miles in them and these parts are basically working not quite on a true center line and they are flexing these parts too much and they cause them to break. So you want to check all these bushings and make sure they're there's no looseness or anything like that. The symptom that you would have in this would be no third or fourth gear because this is an overdrive hub and it comes on in third and fourth gear. Another problem, and this is in the gear set half, is where the splines fit in. Sometimes it rips the splines out of the carrier and that gives you the same symptom. When you're installing these steel plates and they separate all these clutch discs, a lot of them will have like these steps, like here's a step right here, where it looks like this uh, lug is kind of machined a certain distance back from the outer edge, whatever that distance may be. And when you go to install these things, the step is always going to face down. And if you have a step on both sides, well, the larger of the two steps are always going to face down. These transmissions have a few of these tapered snap rings and the taper is sometimes hard to see but basically they taper the outer edge here a little bit and the idea behind this is in these input drums and in the case they're going to have a snap ring on the bottom it's a flat snap ring and that fits inside the the case or the uh, the input drum assembly i'm going to draw the whole thing here and uh, a, uh, a plate, you know, like on the previous slide where I said there's a plate with a step, those plates fit on top of that flat snap ring. But so they don't have to get too crazy tight with their tolerances when cutting these grooves. They purposefully make the, um, the top groove there a little bit looser, a little bit larger than they need to be. So that way, no matter how thick this plate is, as long as they know it's sitting above this bottom edge right here, that they can put a tapered snap ring in there. And that tapered snap ring is going to wedge itself in there. So it's, I've seen students who get these mixed up, get these flipped, put the flat one on top or something, and it won't work right unless you've got the flat snap ring for the plate to sit in on the bottom and the tapered snap ring with the tapered side up fitting in above the plate. By doing it this way, um, that you know, obviously these things, it wedges it in, it keeps this plate from being loose. It does, doesn't have the ability of moving up and down anymore. And they don't have to get extremely precise when they're machining these grooves. So that's what you want to look out for. The, the taper always faces up. And what they do is they paint. Uh, you know, you get a new, new um, tapered snap rings, they'll put spray paint on one side of them and you always want the painted side down and the tapered side will be on the top of those and the taper goes up. This is the oil pump on the earlier um, 41TEs. The newer ones have a different gear design. They don't look like this. This is a gear and crescent design. You got the little crescent here in the middle. It's a good pump. It's a positive displacement, meaning it's going to move fluid. It's going to move more fluid when it's spinning faster and less when it's spinning slower. But one of the things that we look at here 
a lot of students will bring up they think this pump is burnt up because it's discolored right there that there's nothing wrong with that that's just the heat treating that they put on those splines and so forth and then there's also these looks like these check balls that are pushed into these holes they basically use those once they cross drill this thing they got their machines that are drilling holes in them they plug them off with check balls when they're done so they don't have to put like other types of it's probably the cheapest way to make a plug and sometimes the plugs are sitting up a little bit and when they machine this surface flat it looks they grind uh, the, the grinder or the cutting tool ends up cutting into those check balls so a lot of students are like hey I got a problem with these check balls are stuck in there and they look like they're ground down that's just the way they're supposed to be and then under these brass spring uh, screens we have um, those those dribbler circuit balls they're in there so when you take this and shake it you can actually hear those check balls moving around in there some of the measurements that we'll do is we'll check to see how much clearance we have between the outer gear and the case and how much gear uh, clearance we have between the crescent and the inner gear the crescent and the outer gear and then the most important measurement is your end your side clearance so with the with this half bolted onto that half how much side clearance does this gear these gears have and one of the easiest ways that you can do that is lay a piece of plastic gauge right here then bolt the two halves together take it off and see how much it squeezed the plastic gauge just like you do in engines the other way that you can do it is you can get a if you have a flat bar that can sit in there and you can slide a feeler try to slide a feeler gauge underneath it but the problem is is it's usually less than a thousandth of an inch and your feeler gauges are uh, usually start at one and a half thousandths is you know the smallest you usually find a feeler gauge at there's always about a million and one ways that you can screw something up uh, there's a little when you're replacing the bearings and so forth there's this little tab right there that's supposed to fit into this groove if you don't have it in the groove and you tighten all this stuff up you're going to potentially damage the case they do put shims and there's not they're not pictured here but there's selective shims that go between the bearing and the shafts the output shaft and then the uh, transfer shaft you want to make sure you don't mix those up because they're going to be different from each side a couple specs or measurements things that you can see uh, you know looking at this bottom chart here clutch pack clearances you could see 35 to 58 30 to 104 it's a huge clearance so this one here has got oh a little bit more than 20 thousandths because it's got 23 thousandths from lowest to highest this one here is 19 thousandths from lowest to highest I'm doing the math right I think so this one down here is 22 thousandths from lowest to highest so those are all pretty tight but then you look at these other ones 30 to 104 I'm allowed 74 thousandths variation from lowest to high and then this one on the bottom was at 60 86 thousandths that's huge so these two clutches overdrive and 24 have these huge windows for clearance 30 to 104 and 42 to 128 128 that's an eighth of an inch a little bit more but the everything else is got a 20 thousandths window or so to operate in well if you look every clutch has a selection selective reaction plates like the snap rings like the pressure plate the ones that are um, got tight tolerances like around 20 thousandths those are the ones that have select selective plates or snap rings available the ones that are not uh, adjustable they don't have uh, they're the ones that have the greatest amount of um, slop or measurement so if you can't get these two within those specs you've got something assembled wrong because they're never at the extremes they're always somewhere in the middle and that's the way it should be because there is no way to adjust them there's no selection available that's why they give you a big window to work within so if you don't if you can't fit within this window 
you've likely got something misassembled. One of the things that's interesting is those oil pump clearances. These transmissions have been plagued with uh, codes like a, a um, lack of prime is one of the codes and that means that the transmission, the engine's running, uh, that should be developing pressure, yet none of the pressure switches that should be closed are closing. So instead of giving a pressure switch error, they say there's no prime, we're not getting any pressure. So these are some of the specs that you might come across. The outer gear decrescent, that was one of the measurements. You can see it's around 2.3 to 11.7 thousandths. Inner gear decrescent, it's a lot up to 15 thousandths. Outer gear to pocket, that's the most outermost measurement there. It's about 8 thousandths of an inch. And then the side clearances, these are really tight. Remember I said the smallest feeler gauge you pretty much have is a one and a half thousandths feeler gauge? Well, you wouldn't be able to, uh, if, it was a t uh, if it was a tight fitting gear set, you wouldn't be able to fit that in, in there and you'd barely be able to fit it in there if, um, uh, if it's at the high end of its spec. And then this is the input shaft end plate. If you got this uh, transmission completely assembled and you just grab onto the input shaft with the dial indicator, you measure how much up and down movement. At the max, you should have between 5 thousandths and 25 thousandths, so it's not much. It's adjustable by a shim that lives um, on top of the gear set between the overdrive hub and the um, front gear set there. So overdrive hub and the, uh, the reaction, not, or not reaction, but the front sun gear assembly, the shell that fits on there, there is a... Uh, selective washer that you can change to get the end play where you need it.